Welcome back, everyone, for another uh, Q&A show. Um, anything that I say is definitely not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. Check with your doctor before accepting any of this advice. Uh, we definitely don't want to give you cure you, um, and if we do, don't mention our names. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right, well, All right, uh, I'll, I'll step in here, and we've got some very exciting uh, bright individuals in the green room, which we'll be getting to throughout the hour. And in fact, one of them, Will, keeps popping off and on. So I'm going to try to get him before his entire system implodes. And Will, if you would unmute yourself, I'm going to put you on with Dr. Berg. There you go. With your one question, 30 seconds, please. All right. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Dr. Berg. I've really enjoyed your content. Thank you. Um, it's a tea-related question, kind of twofold. You mentioned one time that if you buy the uh, you know, the bottle lemon juice that is pasteurized, the vitamin C has kind of been destroyed. So if I squeeze my own or organic lemon into really hot steeping tea, does mm -hmm. that also destroy it? And the second part of that is if I mix different kinds of tea, like mullein leaf and lemon balm, uh, does the, do the effects get mixed up or, or, or mm -hmm. altered in any way, or is it okay to mix different teas like that and still get the intended desired effect? Good question. When you, when you're um, taking um, vitamin C, for example, um, you have a couple things that degrade it really fast. You have uh, the exposure to oxygen. <laughs> That's why uh, a lemon is so filled with antioxidants to protect it. Uh, and then you also have heat. Uh, but when they pasteurize it, they, usually uh, have high heats, much higher, hotter than you would put with your water, and then longer, so they would cook it for a longer period of time. So I think uh, putting it in the some hot water is not gonna be a problem. You're not gonna lose that much. And when you blend different teas together, um, especially if it's within you know, different herbs, you, you're not gonna negate any of the effects at all. I think they'll work synergistically and help you. Um, but, um, also realize that a lot of the phytonutrient benefits from tea um, can survive some of this heat. So that's, that's another interesting thing. Um, um, like I, I even thought omega-3 fatty acids were destroyed with pasteurization. And so I told people that, and I even did a video on it. And then, um, so I said, that's why I said, you know, when you have your sardines, for example, you're probably not going to get very much omega-3. And then I thought I started thinking about it. I'm like, I, I, I don't know that for a fact. So I sent it to the lab and I found out, sure enough, there were major high levels of omega-3 in sardines and canned fish, which I just blew me away. So apparently certain things can survive, but vitamin C is low on the list. The only time you would see vitamin C in like canned orange juice, whatever, or even lemon juice is when they add it in there as a preservative usually synthetically. Well, thank you, sir. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, uh, Will. And you didn't pop off. So now you can stay on there and watch the rest of the show and have a blast. And by the way, once again, the most, one of the most refreshing things about Dr. Berg is he is sort of ego free when it comes to facts. He's very willing to change his mind or discover new things. And his interest is in the truth and what helps people. And, you know, his, uh, you know, um, having to sort of re, uh, test uh, his results is not a, a, against him at all. So I think it's just terrific. Thank you, Doc, for your clarity on, and transparency and all that stuff. Why don't we kick it off with the first uh, quiz question of the day? And Doc, there it is. All right, good. So let's see if I could find, okay, here it is right here. All right, why does sulforaphane reduce symptoms of autism? Sulforaphane is that chemical in broccoli sprouts, but it's in other cruciferous vegetables as well. Why, why would that I mean, that's pretty wild that a, a chemical on a plant can actually reduce um, autism uh, symptoms. So um, what do you think the mechanism is? Just go ahead and type it, and then uh, let's see if you're correct. All right. I have every faith in the audience there, the fastest answers in the on the globe. Okay, let's, speaking of social media, let's go there. And this one is from Zappa on YouTube. What is your opinion on nootropics? And boy, that word sure does come up a lot lately. These are certain compounds that help um, focus memory, um, your brain, and um, they're not they're not like necessarily just stimulants. There's certain uh, 
chemicals that you can use to, to do that. Now I experimented with this a while ago and I didn't see much benefit. Other people say they, they, it really helps them focus. Um, my, my question is, and my thought is on that before you would go in that direction, I would make sure first that your diet is squared away because, um, you know, so many people are trying to fix like memory or focus on top of a crappy diet or e even like when you run your brain on ketones um, and you do intermittent fasting, you'd be shocked to find how your cognitive function improves as well as your mood. And you wouldn't necessarily even need to take a supplement. So I always like the supplements after you've tried the basic eating plan. Um, and so, you know, like why, why would it be, um, why would you have a problem with focus in the first place or memory in the first place? Um, that's what I would address. But nootropics are definitely uh, very popular and um, a lot of people are experimenting with them and the, the, it's not, a, it's just the wild, wild west right now. There's like people are, well, try this and try this. Cause there's, there's not, there's so many different variables involved and um, it's something you would just have to experiment with on yourself to see if that could help you. Okay. Very good. Still on YouTube. Uh, Bratinga wants to know, do blue blockers for devices actually work? So maybe some red filter. I think they do. They do. And they do protect you against that uh, blue light which is damaging uh, on certain parts of the eye. Um, also realize that um, when you're using your cell phone, um, you're getting a lot of blue light or your laptops, you're just getting a lot of blue light. Um, and that's, that's not good for your eyes. Um, it, it tires the eyes. Um, but when you get the full spectrum of sun, for example, that you're exposing to the eyes, um, also realize that um, the ultraviolet, I'm sorry, the in, um, infrared that comes from the sun, which, by the way, is a little bit more than 50% of that rays, will tend to help to cancel out or reduce the effects of these other harmful rays because it's in a full spectrum. Um, so, I mean, blue blockers are, are, are good, but um, if we're talking about damage to the retina or damage to the lens, or the back part of the retina called the macula. Um, we'll be talking about more of that after the first, after we actually answer the first, or actually second question, I think it is. But um, I, I will mention more about that later. Okay, that's very good. And here's a question. Let's see. And thank you, Roy, for this, because it sounds interesting. Please share your thoughts on complex carbs versus simple carbs. What's the difference there? Oh, it's too complex of a question. No. Um, All right, forget the complex it. Right? Carbs, you're talking about, you know, vegetables, right? But but people are going to also throw in their grains, starches, things like that. Um, simple simple carbs would be like table sugar, refined sugars, that type of thing. Um, so that's kind of what they're talking about, and that's that's a that's a good good idea to eat complex carbohydrates. But I would only eat them in the form of vegetables and maybe a small amount of berries. Uh, but vegetables have the, um, that's the complex carbohydrates. But sometimes they mesh in there. Well, you can do the, you know, fruits, grains, and vegetables. Yeah, they have to throw that grain in there, which is not very good. All right, watch out for that, folks. Uh, and we watched out for questions and the audience responded. So the first quiz question for the day, ask the audience, why do sulforaphane reduce symptoms of autism? And they have an opinion. 65% of the respondents say sulforaphane reduces inflammation in the brain. 35% say it reduces oxidative stress. Everyone's correct. Everyone Yay. is correct. We got 100% correction on that. You're right. When you have autism, I won't get into like what's really triggering autism, but I will say this. Um, we have a lot of oxidative stress. Now, what the heck is oxidative stress? Well, it's an imbalance of our own body's uh, antioxidants with the oxidation that's coming in the brain. And then you have neuroinflammation, you have brain inflammation. And it just so happens that there is um, a certain protein in the body, which is the master, master regulator of all of your antioxidants that the body produces, like glutathione, things like that. And uh, it's NRF2, this little protein. And uh, it just so happens that the sulforaphane is a very unique molecule in that it can 
turn up that protein and make it work much higher than um, normally. And so now we're going to get uh, a, all these antioxidants coming in there to the rescue. We're going to get anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory effects from the sulforaphane. The sulfur, sulfur, sulforaphane is interesting to me because it can kill H. pylori, which is behind ulcers. It can, um, well, I guess this is going to be related to some other questions, so I think I'll stop there. But it's a fascinating molecule, and I'm going to be doing a video on all the things that can turn up that protein and all the conditions that it can help. So it's something you want to stay tuned for. Okay, very good. Let's see. Mary Moore from YouTube. What's the best way to reduce elevated potassium levels? Well, the first question is, are you measuring this in your blood or the inside the cell? Because like 98% of all the potassium is intracellular, intracellular potassium. So I highly doubt that you're measuring it there. There is many situations where you have too much potassium on the, in the blood, but it's very deficient inside the cell. And, there's, and that usually could occur because you're eating a lot of carbs. So carbohydrates tend to create a, a shift in this potassium. Um, but if you have too much potassium, truly too much potassium, then um, you, which is very rare, um, called hyperkalemia, then you would need to take more sodium to balance it out. And um, the body has a lot of different mechanisms to get rid of excess potassium, by the way. Um, and a really good test for you to do, if, if you think you have too much, is to find um, a test. I think you can do a home test where you measure the intracellular potassium. And you may be shocked to find out that that's very low. So can't always go by the blood. All right, very good. Jay, uh, let's see. No, Rosa from YouTube. Water fast versus a dry fast, which is better in your opinion? Well, she's already passed away from dehydration. No, I'm kidding. Which is better? Well, dry fasting where you're not having any water and you're fasting is extremely powerful, potent. It's, it's better than water fasting. Um, but of course, there's a limitation of time. So if you do a dry fast for two weeks, that might be a problem. Um, in fact, I don't think you can live that long with that water. But there has been someone who, um, they were in a jail cell. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they lasted 13 days without water, but they actually did consume the condensation on the walls, which is not a lot of water, but that was a little bit, little bit of water. But um, dry fasts are, are, they just add more stress to the body. And I think it's, it's good to do short term. But again, you got to work into this. So you got to be fairly healthy to do that <laughs> um, because some people, are so low in electrolytes and so dehydrated that when they start doing these prolonged fasting right off the bat or a dry fast, and then they end up, you know, having, they might get, they might faint or have a problem with that. So I would um, go into this gingerly and gradually if I were you. Okay, very good. Ingrid from YouTube, here we go. What are your thoughts about carb cycling to establish a metabolic reset? I love it. I love it. I don't know whoever invented that theory or, or that concept that you have to recycle your carbs for, for, for metabolism. It, it just is, is illogical. There's, it doesn't make sense. Um, we, we've already been recycling our carbs um, for on this diet that so many people like they binge in carbs and they get off carbs. Like, that's recycling right there. So um, adding more carbs to recycling to help reset something from my viewpoint, is total rubbish. It's like you don't need to reset your metabolism with carbs. Right. So I mean, it just it's illogical. Yeah. So take two cups of sugar and then call us in the morning. Let us know how you feel after you've recycled all that. Okay. Let's see. Why don't we launch another question, Doc? And here it is. Okay. Good. Why now? Um, the next question would be: Why would selenium help reduce symptoms of HIV and AIDS? Wow, that's a big one. Okay, and while you're all thinking about that, why don't we go back to the um, green room, and this time we're going to bring on uh, Adrienne Diaz, and uh, she is, uh, I forgot to ask her where she's from, but she's indeed wherever she is, and you're on the air. Uh, Adrienne, go with your one question, please, dear, in 30 seconds. 
Hi, I'm in Virginia. Um, okay, so I've had my gallbladder removed, um, my right kidney removed um, due to renal cell carcinoma. Um, and I need to lose weight because I have a kidney stone in my other kidney um, before I can get that removed. Um, so it's hard for me to exercise because also my left knee is hurting. So I have like all these like issues. I guess I'm just getting old, but, um, I'm on metformin and I saw your iodine videos and I am low on iodine, um, cause it disappeared right away, but I have a craving for sweets and sodas and it doesn't seem that the metformin is working. So I'm wondering, is there something that I can take, um, to eat, to like curb the sweets and cravings. Um, mm -hmm. so that way I can like lose weight and, you know, be healthier. Sure. Are, are you, are you on metformin because you're diabetic? No. Um, it's because I had all these other issues and she was like, well, I don't think it's, um, you know, you need medicine for your arthritis or this. She was like, I think it's because you're obese and you need to get, your weight down and then your knee would feel better and you know, you would just feel better overall if you lost mm -hmm. weight. So that's why I'm on the metformin. Okay. The metformin um, <clears throat> targets insulin resistance, which is behind uh, a lot of uh, diabetic issues, but it also um, high insulin puts you at risk for kidney stones and um, gallbladder problems and uh, weight gain and all these other things. So, um, the first thing that I would do as a really good idea would be to, um, go to my, um, website and just click videos. And it has the first video there. Start watching one, the first video, then the second, the third, and start applying the basics of the ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting together as one. Um, that's going to create a, a really cool effect, um, for your weight loss. You're going to start losing weight. And with the way that, you know, that it's working even before you lose a pound is that your hunger will go away and your cravings will go away, making it easier to, to do this longer term. So then, then you, then you'll lose weight and you'll feel better. And uh, this is like creating a better effect than metformin, but without the side effects. And then if you wanted to speed it up, there's another, um, there's an herb that has been compared to metformin, but without the side effects because there is some major side effects with metformin and that would be berberine. Berberine is a good, good one to take as you're doing keto and intermittent fasting. I would also take a sea kelp. Okay. A sea kelp has the iodine in it. It's a good source. You don't have to take a lot. Just take a little bit of sea kelp uh, and a tablet. And then what'll happen that will even help your thyroid and, and speed up your metabolism. I have a lot of videos on kidney stones. And so um, make sure that you're it, immediately you're you're drinking at least 2.5 liters of fluid a day and that will actually keep it from getting worse uh have some lemon in your water um and uh even a little apple cider vinegar like a tablespoon because that'll that'll be good for your kidney stone as you do the ketogenic diet though very important to uh avoid certain foods that could worsen the kidney stone like spinach Almonds and almond flour, chocolate, okay? Because those are high in a certain thing mm -hmm. that makes kidney stones. Not, not that you ever eat those and you would ever even consider eating them, but you probably know neighbors and friends <laughs> that might eat those things. <clears throat> but um, that's my mm -hmm. suggestion. And I think that would be successful. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. And you got, uh, Adrian, you've got a lot of stuff going on there. And we wish you the best and hope to hear back. Uh, some success stories uh, from you in the future yes. as you work against all that. So appreciate it. Now, let's see. we got a shout out. A little truncated today, but I bet it's going to grow because more people are going to check in. So, so far around the globe, we'd like to say thank you to our viewers uh, joining us from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Algeria, Jordan, Australia, Malaysia, Guam, Kenya, Ghana, United Arab Emirates, Hungary, Serbia, the Netherlands, Nigeria, India, Chile, Pakistan, Argentina, Norway, 
Poland, Japan, New Zealand, Spain, Aruba, Qatar, Yemen, France, Dubai, Lithuania, the Virgin Islands, and uh, uh, Virgin Islands, Malta, Uganda, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Kuwait, Jamaica, Slovenia, South Africa, and all across these United States. And coming up soon will be Richard from Denmark speaking of the devil. But we're going to do a few things first, Richard, but we'll have you up next. And let's see. So speaking of next, we have some answers back on quiz question number two. Again, an example of just how astute our audience is and how quickly they answer it. So the question asks, why would selenium help reduce symptoms uh, from HIV and AIDS, which is a great thing. And um, 100% of respondents say selenium, uh, selenium is an antioxidant and an immune system booster for the body. Okay, so that's absolutely true. But there's a, there's a very interesting reason why selenium is um, used as a protocol, um, a natural protocol that um, with, with about three more amino acids. Um, uh, you know what's interesting about HIV? It's a, this virus <clears throat> that really uh, has the potential to wipe out um, the key player in your immune system called the T helper cell. And so that's what it does. It takes out the quarterback. And now without a quarterback, you can't, you can't win. And so here you are with an immune system that doesn't work and you're very vulnerable to getting infections all over the place and tumors and cancer and et cetera. So, um, What's unique about this virus is that it has the ability to strategically make glutathione, which is a really key antioxidant. Because in this virus, like you have a lot of oxidation, a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation, but <clears throat> um, the that T four help helper cell uh, needs glutathione to get it to work. So without glutathione, because Think about this. This virus is making all this glutathione for its own accord and depleting you of the raw materials to make it, which is selenium. So it, it's very um, nasty because it sucks up your selenium, keeping you high and dry with no reserves because it's making this glutathione, hogging it all. And then you end up without enough glutathione because you don't have the selenium to make it. And then you can't make that T helper cell. And that's when things go downhill. So a really uh, brilliant um, professor came up with a protocol. And uh, I'm going to be talking about it in, in a video. He wrote a book on it. And I think it's like, wow, what a simple way to strengthen your immune system. And apparently there's a couple other viruses that do the same thing, like uh, the one for hepatitis B and hep hepatitis C, which selenium would also be a good remedy for. But I think this is just a fascinating, um, sneaky little thing that these viruses do. And it's important if you know the mechanism, then you can, you can even counter it further with natural things. So well, that's my long answer. Very good. And if you want more answers, of course, you can go to Dr. Berg's wonderful online app. Uh, and you can get that on your iOS, uh, iPhone device or Android. So you'll have a world of answers in your pockets. Make sure you download that today. And let's go over to, um, to Facebook. Where did I, I miss my question from Facebook? Oh, to heck, let's go back and shout out for some more people. I knew that was coming. Let's shout out to our viewers in Indonesia, Germany, Bangladesh, Botswana, Sierra Leone, Bulgaria, Belize, Scotland, the Philippines, Venezuela, Pakistan, Romania, Trinidad and Tobago, and Portugal. Can you imagine most shows, even the big ones, would die for three or four countries around the world? And we just darn near got a pin in, uh, in every map around the country. So that's great. Thanks, everybody, so much for tuning in. Uh, let's see, Sarah from YouTube. What are the best supplements to take to treat PCOS? Um, inositol is a good one. It's called, uh, I would take a myo inositol. That's a good one. And berberine, those two, in addition to getting on keto, because we have a problem with too much androgen, which is coming from too much insulin. And so inositol, which by the way, is a kind of a, it's a B vitamin that's sweet. You can suck on them as little candies. And uh, you'd be like, wow, this is like candy. Uh, but it's not. It's a B vitamin and it's really good for uh, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, um, but definitely get on the keto diet because um, you, it's not going to work 
if you're also doing countering the benefit of uh, uh, the um, countering it by doing too many carbs. Okay, very good. I found that question. Uh, it was from Bernal Joy from Facebook. Will consuming almond flour bread regularly affect the kidneys? Um, here's the thing with almond flour. Um, it, it is a bit of a refined thing from almonds. It is high in oxalates and those people that have, um, susceptibility to kidney stones could have a problem. It's one of those things that you would have to try before and after and see how you feel. But these oxalates to, uh, are damaging to the kidney. They are. And so too much, uh, too much of them can, um, really mess with your kidneys and other joints. So again, you have high oxalates in um, almonds, almond flour. But typically, I mean, like, there's other benefits from, from almonds. But again, the key thing is the oxalate. So you would want to avoid, of course, rhubarb in the rhubarb pie, which I know Steve loves. And then um, chocolate, kiwi, um, Swiss chard, and, and make mental note, Xylitol. Xylitol apparently increases oxalates in your body, or it has oxalates in there. So uh, if you have uh, kidney stones or even pseudo gout, um, it could be aggravated by this darn xylitol, which you say, well, I don't have xylitol as a sweetener. Well, do you ever chew gum? Is it like sugar-free gum? Well, it's, it's loaded with xylitol. So xylitol is in other things as well. Watch out for that substance. Okay, uh, Adamson, 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 there, I said it right, from Facebook. Any suggestions to, to treat pancreatitis, which I understand is a lot of fun? Yeah, there, um, I think the, the first thing I would do, um, if I were you, I'm assuming you're on keto and intermittent fasting. I'm assuming that. I might be wrong. But let's say you are, um, and you have pancreatitis. One of the causes of pancreatitis um, would be some type of block, uh, blockage of the duct um, that's that kind of drains into this little hole into your small intestine called the sphincter body, which is a small little uh, valvular hole that joins with the bile duct. So they have the pancreatic duct, the bile duct, they join. And so this is why if you have a deficiency of bile, that can cr create a sludge even a stone, and that can block, block those ducts and then back up into the pancreas and you get pancreatitis. So the remedy would be tutka, which is a, um, it's a, it's a type of bile salt. But I will say, as a side note, since uh, our first guest uh, mentioned iodine, if you're deficient in iodine, you can also have a problem with your bile because then the, because the thyroid starts to become sluggish. And without a good thyroid, um, your bile gets sluggish as well. So everything can become sluggish, cholesterol. And it's the perfect storm because if you have a sluggish thyroid and you have this unmetabolized cholesterol buildup and unavailable cholesterol to make bile, which is, it comes from, bile com comes from cholesterol. So now we get this uh, perfect storm to make stones, all because you are low in iodine. And that's very common. I mean, I think 2 billion people on this planet are low in iodine. Huh. And by the way, Doc, are there a number of tests for that? Or is it just one? Blood test, find out about your iodine. There's a, there's a lot of tests. You, you can check your blood test, but also um, you can do a patch test. And I, I have a video on that. You just put a little uh, drop of iodine on your skin and see if it gets absorbed within a period of time or, or not. And um, it absorbs pretty quickly. We know you're probably deficient because your body is sucking it up. The problem with iodine is that um, it's, our soils are so depleted because we only put back in three minerals, NPK. We don't put the trace minerals back in there. So you're, you're eating all this food that doesn't have iodine because the soil is not loaded with iodine unless you have shellfish or seafood or consume plants that are on 100 miles from the shore. But who does that? Huh. They don't do that. All right. Well, I promised to go to Denmark and Richard... Richard, if you'd unmute yourself, you are on with Dr. Bird. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me on your show. Uh, 
first of all, I'd like to say that um, I've been on a ketogenic diet now for about one and a half months. Um, I had a lot of problems with um, GERD and acid reflux, and uh, my blood pressure was 170, 80 over 110. It wasn't as if I was uh, I was very large, uh, um, 84 kilos, 85 kilos. Now I've lost six kilos. I'm down to 78 and a half. All my GERD and my acid reflux has disappeared. Wow. Um, ha- and my blood pressure fell uh, fell to 126 over 83. Wow. So all in all, it was a uh, it was uh, a really a really good wake up call. However, my blood pressure is down to 180. Um, I suspect it's something to do with my electrolytes. Uh, I haven't had any blood work done, um, so I started taking my blood pressure meds again. I'm on uh, Losartan Medical Valley, 100, uh, 100 milligrams. Uh, but I take my uh, daily hibiscus tea, my wheatgrass and my cod liver oil, and basically I feel like I've got a new lease of life. Wow. So uh, basically, how do I maintain balanced levels of uh, electrolytes to uh, bring my uh, blood pressure down again. Thank you very much. Sure. There's two factors to blood pressure that are the big factors, the obvious ones. And especially when you do the ketogenic diet, you lose a lot of weight, you lose a lot of water weight, and you lose a lot of electrolytes. So you need um, about um, 4,700 milligrams. Now, how many, uh, what does that come out to uh, with with your foods? That's a lot of greens. That's a lot of greens brings leafy salads to get that much amount of electrolytes in your body to get your blood pressure in check. But if you were to consume uh, an electrolyte powder with a lot more potassium, because out of all the minerals and vitamins, nothing is of the magnitude of potassium as far as requirements. We need so much. So um, that that usually keeps the arteries very, very uh, elastic, pliable, so it prevents the hardening of the arteries. It helps the kidney, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and it also um, can help lower blood pressure from several different angles. So that's one thing. Um, and it also, if you have an electrolyte powder or even consume more vegetables, you also have the magnesium with it. So magnesium potassium is the low hanging fruit to um, address blood pressure. Now, other things, vitamin D levels, uh, low vitamin D, situation can spike uh, blood pressure as well. So that's another thing that I would take. Uh, Those are the two things that come to mind um, that I would go right after. And I think that can bring down the blood pressure. I'm glad that your GERD um, is going away. Um, GERD, you know, GERD is like an acid reflux situation that's more advanced because it irritates your your esophagus. And uh, I always tell people, if you go to the doctor with your GERD, ask the doctor this one question. Um, what's the difference between, what's, what's, try to get them to differentiate between, is the this problem too much acid or is it too much acid in the wrong place? Because they never, ever, ever check the production of acid in your stomach. They assume that you have, your body's producing too much acid when in fact, it's just the opposite. If they did test, they would find you're not producing very much acid at all, and that's keeping the valve open, and that's why the acid is in the wrong place, making you assume that you have too much, and then you you start taking in acids, and then that's when things go down south. But uh, so anyway, that's uh, my long answer to your simple question. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to add that I'm taking 10 to 20,000 IUs of vitamin D a day, plus uh, around about 500 uh, milligrams of uh, magnesium as well. Okay, and then I think you I think you need to go with the potassium then. Uh, we need, the problem is yeah. if you go try to find a regular pills, I don't know what they have in Europe now, but they're only like 99 milligrams. So you 90, need- 90. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, you need to find something with a lot more, um, um, a powder that has a, you know, at least a thousand milligrams and take, take a couple scoops of that. And that will, uh, I think that I think you'll. That's your answer. Well, I've I've ordered your lemon and raspberry, so uh, that, that should be coming through the post in a few days. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that'll help. All right. Thanks so much, Richard. And uh, to demonstrate. Yeah.
demonstrate here. This, I just chugged this, and Dr. Berg was too shy to show his own product, but I'm not. So there it is, and that's coming in the mail to you. So hang on there, Richard, and it's packed with all sorts of stuff. And I used to get cramps in my legs when I jogged, and then I started taking this and some extra water, I'll admit that too. And all is well. So thanks so much, uh, Richard, from uh, Denmark for coming on with us. Let's leap over and go to the next quiz question. Here it is, speaking of antacids and so on. Okay, why would antacids, PPIs, um, which are like um, any type of acid suppression medication, why would those give a side effect of acid reflux? Now, I probably just gave out the answer, but let's just see what people say as they're listening intently. <laughs> okay, yeah, they were running for a cup of joe or something, I'm sure, hopefully. So that'll make that interesting. Okay, let me... Mark, that we just put that question forth. And let's go back to social media. Matt from Facebook. Any advice for someone who's 32 who eats mostly carnivore, probably less than 1,500 calories a day? I'm still gaining weight. Poor guy. I ride my bike five miles a day, six days, six days a week. What else should I be doing? Goodness. Well, one of the things uh, um, with the carnivore diet is um, you can very easily consume a bit too much protein and protein does turn to sugar if you have too much because it's your body can't assimilate all that so some of it's converted to glucose and so that could be one of the reasons why your insulin's high and you're gaining weight so um how do we fix that um well then you want to reevaluate re your food and believe it or not go down with the protein and up with your fat now i know what you're going to say is like wait a second i'm eating all this fat i'm going to well, fat won't increase the insulin. It may just help with the insulin response and lower the insulin um, because you're having less uh, protein. That ratio is, is going to be like more fat than protein. So what, what would that look like as far as types of foods? Well, they have the fatty sausage. Another one is actually that I like is um, cod liver. Yeah, you can get it in a can and and it does taste great. And you might go, that sounds disgusting, but it's uh, very high in fat and lower in protein, but it's a uh, odd liver. It has a lot of the oil in there too. So that, that might help you. And um, then uh, some other ones, um, which I don't, well, if you're carnivore, you're not going to do macadamia nuts or pecans, but um, there's other recipes like fatty or pork, you know, high quality pork. Um, but that's probably what you want to do. If you do carnivore and you do lean uh, proteins, it's probably not the best thing. Also, egg, eggs is a good one. And then uh, also organ meats as well. And uh, fatty salmon. Um, and then um, if you're doing 1,500 calories a day and you're exercising, um, you know, I don't know also, are you doing, um, how frequently are you eating those meals? Are, What's your intermittent fasting pattern? Because let's just, just pretend like you're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet and you eat all those 2,000 calories in one meal versus spread it out through the day. Believe it or not, you'll lose more weight if you, if you eat it one meal, even with the same amount of calories because you're not spreading it out. So the more intermittent fasting you can do, the longer you can fast, the more the weight loss. All right, very good. Uh, Solid Nate is his handle from YouTube. I have uh, st stricturing Crohn's. Would the carnivore diet help uh, or and or treat my symptoms? That's a terrible one. Yeah, I think it will because the more you have an irritated, uh, inflamed colon, the more you need to do um, uh, carnivore, um, at least temporarily, to kind of let everything heal up. But um, that fibers and vegetables can irritate it and definitely grains will just kill it. Um, like especially wheat and gluten and all that. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Uh, make sure you look up how to do it healthily and, um, that you'll find that your inflammation will drop considerably in your, in your gut. Very good. I guess, uh, uh, hang on just a second here. Okay question we've got answers for quiz question number three rapidly and it asks why would antacids ppis acid suppression give the side effects of acid reflux which we've been talking about a lot today and a hundred percent 
of our, uh, boy, here's 100% again, respondents say reductions or suppression of stomach acid, the body can actually create more acid to make up for the drop in acid levels. That is true for antacids, um, but not necessarily the PPIs or H2 inhibitors. Uh, but anyway, um, so so that's an, that is a correct answer. Oh, good. Um, but what happens with uh, with I mean, think about this: as you age, right, the risk of getting GERD goes up and up as you get older. But at the same time, as we age, the amount of uh, the acidity in our stomach becomes weaker and weaker. So how could it be that you, this strong acid, this bad acid is causing GERDs? The logical. Well, it has to do with this. GERDs, it, GERD is a reflux problem. It's a valve problem. And the valve, there's sensors. There's a valvular sensors for, for your acid. <clears throat> so when your acid becomes very, very strong, that valve can close really nicely and can and stay tight. When the acid becomes weak, it stays open because the information it's getting is like, well, okay, food's coming in. We better, you know. So um, the point is that um, if you take an acid like betaine hydrochloride or any type of regurgitation problem you have, and that would be heartburn, acid reflux, GERD, reflux disease, silent GERD, like there's 20 different labels for the same problem. Uh, You generally will feel better. Um, and this is why if you have a, if there's a skeptic out there that doesn't believe me and says there's no scientific proof, I said, well, just go ahead and try it. And if you feel better, then, you know, um, because if it is true that you don't have enough acid for, and, and you have this GERD and you start taking things to suppress, suppress your acid, guess what's going to happen in the future as you do this long-term, you're going to go from bad to worse because without that stomach acid now you can't break down protein you can't absorb iron or b12 you become anemic you're going to get tired and you're very susceptible to getting pathogens and viruses that leach out into the body and so you might end up with SIBO or a lot of bloating or other issues um so there's a lot of problems that can occur from these acid suppressing drugs and uh so again, I'm going to, I'll create another video to talk about that. Cause that's like a really important thing for people to understand if they have this, uh, if they're on uh, antacids, um, uh, boy, that I wish I would have known about this when I had an ulcer when I was in my early twenties, which is like terribly bad to have that, that young. Interesting. Okay. Speaking of acid, true, false, our next question. All right. I'll let you read it, doc. Here it is all about acid. Okay, for false, stomach acid should normally be at at least 100,000 times more acid than your blood. Is that true or false? All right, climb on that audience, as I know you will. Let's go back to the green room, and next up, and ask him to unmute himself as Chakra from Arkansas. Chakra, you're on with Dr. Bird. Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, thanks for all the content. I myself benefited from the intermittent fasting. I was having uh, pre-diabetic levels. I was having uh, high blood pressure. Able to follow your videos, and I was able to treat myself, and I'm in better shape now. So the problem is with my kid. Now she is six years old. She has autoimmune, which like condition. Uh, the doctor prescribed some oral ointments, and the ointment like uh, steroid and um, the eczema, tropical ointments. We don't want to go that route. Uh, could you please help us with uh, what levels of vitamin D uh, can be given for a six-year-old, like zinc and maybe copper, which you are talking about in the videos? What what uh, what specific type of autoimmune disease does she have? Vitiligo. Oh, vitiligo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. I would definitely, definitely um, start with the vitamin D. Uh, of course, um, sun is very therapeutic. Even certain types of, if I'm not mistaken, you can try uh, uh, UVB light therapy. Uh, that's another one. You can buy one of those little light uh, wands. Uh, apparently, that's been 
been shown to help as well. Um, uh, but yeah, she needs vitamin D. Um, I would do definitely, I would do 10,000. I use the vitamin D every day. I would do that. And, um, again, that's going to help the immune system. I would also highly, uh, recommend, uh, getting her on a, the healthy version of the ketogenic diet because a lot of these autoimmune diseases start in the gut. So you want to make sure that that is in check with a good probiotic. Um, a natural vitamin B1 would also be beneficial, especially for vitiligo, which is a lack of pigment, uh, giving you these um, whiter, a lack of uh, like a like white spots through the body. Um, and so that's, that's what I would do. Uh, those two things, focus on the gut and that vitamin D. Um, to help that condition. So, and of course, when kids get autoimmune diseases, you really need to just understand that something caused it. It just doesn't come for no reason. So um, what happened just before this occurred, and we won't get into this, but that usually there's some event or something that triggered it that you need to deal with. And that gives you the big clue on what you need to focus on uh, because so many people have some event that occurs right before this happening. But People don't look at that as being significant, but it's an important clue uh, on how you should potentially treat someone. Okay, by the way, Chakra, I noticed that you lost transmission for a while, so I would encourage you to watch the show uh, afterwards, and you'll be able to recap exactly what um, Dr. Berg said. And we wish you all the best with your beautiful daughter and hope to uh, hear back with some uh, great results after the fact. So thank you, Chakra, for coming on and, um, and for participating in the show. All right, let's see where we're at here. Um, Karen from YouTube, is the carnivore diet safe? Is it better than the keto diet? Oh, it must be. Well, uh, it, the, the way that I, I look at it is this. Um, um, I don't do the carnivore diet. I, I, I do very, very well, and so does do hundreds of thousands of people on this diet that I'm recommending, which is a combination of plants and, and animal meats as well, uh, because I think there is some, a lot of benefits to plants. Um, but I don't agree with, or I would never do just a plant diet only. Uh, so I like the combination, uh, because if you look through nature, you get most of the nutrients. I mean, from various, you get the nutrients from various sources, not just one thing. Uh, I like the carn carnivore for gut issues, but other than that, I would recommend the combination of plants and animal products. But it's one of those things, instead of kind of getting into tell people, this is the best diet for every single person, you should personally try it out for yourself and see what works for you. Because um, it, I think those two are going to be like the two best things to do, depending on your situation. If you don't have a lot of gut inflammation at all, then I would do, I would add the vegetables in there because that way you can also get plenty of benefits from the phytonutrients from plants, the carotenoids, the anthoxanthins, which uh, or anthocyanins. I mean, that's all these things are are good for um, all sorts of things. Um, Under the complications from diabetes, and then also um, all the potassium, magnesium you can get from vegetables and things like that, and the vitamin C. Um, there's not a lot of vitamin C in meat. There is some, but they're in organ meats. But there's not a lot. Um, so, and then also folate, folate, you can get, you get it from dark leafy greens. So there are certain, um, nutrients, but there, again, if you have just plants, then we're going to get your B12 and, and your zinc. So, so I think a combination would be the ideal diet. Okay. Very good. And audience next up, we have one of our true falsers, which are so fun because you have a 50% chance of being an absolute genius. And here it is. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let's see. And we, we already, already answered. Yeah, so we just right. need the answer. Yeah. Sorry. Here we go. Next one. Very good, Doc. No, we need the answer to that. What For, did the answer me. say, Steve? For, forgive me, Doc. Okay. The answer to that question, 75% um, of respondents say it's true and 25% say it's false. There we go. Okay. Well, I said it's at least... And so that means that it's basically, uh, if we take a comparison from your blood to your stomach acid, 
because see, everyone's a lot of people are against acids, like, oh, we got to alkalize our body, right? Well, then why is the stomach so acid? Normal stomachs should be between a hundred thousand to one million times more acidic than your blood. That is normal. If our bodies were supposed to be alkaline, why is the stomach acid supposed to be so acid? I mean, that's like so acid, it's like battery acid. Um, so when we talk about pH, we should have, um, you have to ask the person, what specific body tissue are you talking about or fluid? Are you talking about the saliva, uh, the small intestine, the large intestine? But that stomach should be very, very acid. And, and people don't know that. We, we're kind of on a, a war to get rid of acid. Look at all the acid suppressing medications out there, right? Well, I would love to ask a doctor, don't we need strong stomach acid? What are these acid suppressing medications going to do to our stomach acid long term? Are there complications? How are we going to now break down protein? How are we going to absorb minerals? How are we going to kill pathogens in our stomach level? These are all questions that you need to ask the doctor before you get put on an acid suppressing medication. All right, folks. Which, by the way, now they just, I think they have a class action suit now because now they found out the, some of these PPIs. Um, now I've uh, been causing kidney disease. Well, we already kind of the writings on the wall. Um, unfortunately, it's like um, so many medications have been like recalled or there's been problems down the road because they because people take them long term. And um, what are the side effects long term? Well, we've never done a study on that. We just have to see what happens. OK, well, you can be the person to experiment with that then. All right. Good luck, folks, with that one. Okay, final question uh, for the day, Doc, and there it is. Okay, what food has the highest source of coenzyme Q10? All right, no more true falsers today. Coenzyme Q10 is good for the heart. It's good for um, all of the cells. It works within the mitochondria of your cells. So um, what food would have the highest amounts of that? I think that would be good to know. All right, very good. And we also want to know what Jason' question is, and he is coming to us from Ohio. And Jason, if you'd unmute yourself, you're the last but not least participant uh, in our uh, little green room offering. So go ahead with your one question for Dr. Berg in 30 seconds. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Um, I've been living with an intractable 24-7 migraine for the past 12 years. Mm -hmm which has prevented me from living a normal life. I've tried almost every medication on the market, as well as many other treatments, non-traditional and traditional. No long or short-term remedy has really made a difference. I'm running out of ideas of how to fix it. Routine mm -hmm. blood work and tests usually come back normal. I have been diagnosed with Lyme disease and some co-infections. I also live with ADHD, anxiety, depression, and Crohn's colitis. You say Crohn's? Crohn's colitis is what I've, I've, I've heard several different, I, I was told originally ulcerative colitis, and now I'm told Crohn's colitis. Sometimes they just say colitis. Okay. You gave me a lot of good clues. Um, question, yeah. question I have, um, these terrible migraines that you have, um, was there a point in your life ever that you didn't have them? They were intermittent until I was about 39. And then I had one come on that won't quit. Okay. Was there anything that occurred at that, right around that time, just before that, that might have triggered this? Well, I, it was a stressful time of my life. I'd started a new job. I was doing these trainings. I had a lot more responsibility. I, there was a lot going on in my life at the time. Yeah. Okay. And, and you said it intermittently, like you had these even as a baby? Uh, starting around four years old, five years old. I would get one, it would get real bad, I'd throw up, I'd sleep for hours or a day or whatever, and then I would resume normal life. Okay. And then that was, you know, I'd have one a month or three a year or one a week or whatever over the years. It varied. So in that case, I, I really think uh, that your problem is related to the gut because that's usually what happens when you have it as a baby. The food interacts with the gut and that starts creating all sorts of issues um, with inflammation and that can cause headaches and migraines. Um, so in that case, I would 
seriously consider getting on the carnivore diet and um, and find out how to do it healthily. And I, I think that will probably be the, the thing that's going to turn things around for you because that's going to drop the inflammation versus to try to take a remedy for something. The second thing I would do is I would do a DNA test um, to find out what the heck is going on with your genetics because there are so many genes that could be also interfering with your ability to detoxify, your oxidative stress, methylation. And if you could find out something unique about that, that can give you the answer. And I'll give you just one example. Um, there's a certain gene that uh, could be related to this that uh, is pretty popular. Um, but um, I don't want to get into complexities, but I actually had someone as positive for this gene. And all of they all they needed uh, to do was take um, a very specific type of B12 and folic acid methylfolate. And oh my goodness, uh, the, their whole life changed just from this one genetic test, just learning about one thing that they had a problem with. So that's just another thing that I would uh, do to see um, if there's because that's going to actually uh, help you tailor make um, foods and recommendations more deeply than any, any other thing. It's a new thing. You have to find someone good to help you interpret that, but you definitely the DNA testing and then get on carnivore. And I think um, I would love to have you do that and then come back to us in a few weeks to see if that gave you more relief. I'd love to. All right, that's great. That sounds okay, just welcome. awful, Jason. So we'd love uh, for you to get some relief uh, from that. So thanks so much yeah, for coming. Yeah, um, there's the, I, I, you know, in these things, it's like usually something in the diet that's creating inflammation. That's because the there's this separation between your gut and your and your head. Um, but you have the vagus nerve, so whatever's going on up here in the head, headache wise or pain or whatever, even depression, anxiety. Boy, that could be all coming from your gut. And so, but because it's referred, you, a lot of times people don't make the connection, but I'll tell you, it could be a, a game changer. And I think there'll be some, I, I think it'll make a huge change, but um, I've seen it so many times. All right. Well, Jason, please get back with us. We'd really love to hear that you get some relief. That's just awful. Four years on, oh, you know, that's, that's not fair. All right. Uh, Jason, I, I don't think you had time to look at this question, but we'll give you the answer. So it asks, what food has the highest source of CoQ10? And our audience said, 45% at least said, our respondents say it's beef heart. 25% uh, say organ meats. 10% say liver. 10% say cod liver, which you spoke of, or fish oil. And 10% say salmon. Yeah. So the answer is beef heart. Beef heart. Wow. Um, now, I know probably most people nowadays don't are listening don't normally consume beef heart as a, in their diet. Um, but I don't even know where you can find it, but I will say that um, it, it has some serious benefits uh, for I mean it has um, an ungodly amount of coenzyme Q10, uh, which is what can really help your energy and um, and so there are certain Supplements that people can get, um, they can get like beef liver, like grass fed, um, not beef liver, but uh, heart liver or heart, beef heart. And then also, um, if someone has like some type of bad cardiovascular issue, let's say they have a problem with uh, like repeated heart attacks or, or um, problems with the heart and muscle where they have um, angina and they took uh, beef heart um, as a supplement or even consumed it, boy, uh, they would greatly improve from that condition. So, um, so it's something that uh, consider it's i uh, I'm just want to put this on your radar so you could uh, have it as a, an idea to fall back on. If you, if you need some extra coenzyme Q10, because um, there's even a, a company called um, it's called, let's what's the grass fed meat. Um, U.S. Wellness Meats. U.S. Wellness Meats um, sells a hamburger with some added beef heart. 
And I bought that in the past and you could hardly even taste it. It says, it just tastes just like regular hamburger. But I tell you, that would really be a healthier um, product than just the beef meat. So it's all grass fed. It's for us wellness meats. And so that's just um, doing a plug for them because um, they have very, very great products. And uh, of course, before my farm, I used to order a lot, but now I have so much beef in my freezer that I will never run out uh, ever. On that note, Steve, I really appreciate all the wonderful comments and questions. Um, thank you uh, again for staying on this long. Uh, and we have some great videos coming up. And I will see you guys next Friday in the morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time.